I'm Ted L. Gunderson, a 27-year veteran of the FBI who retired uh, in March of 1979. At the time of my retirement, I was the senior special agent in charge of the FBI Los Angeles Division with more than 700 personnel under my command and a budget of $22.5 million. I was an agent on the street for nine and a half years, and then I advanced administratively. I was a supervisor, and then I was a uh, uh, number two man in Connecticut and Philadelphia, and assistant special agent in charge was the title. And then I became a chief inspector, and then I was the agent in charge in Memphis, Dallas, and the senior special agent in charge in uh, Los Angeles, because I had three other special agents in charge under me and 24 supervisors under them. I have uh, information chiseled in stone, documented, that the FBI had advanced knowledge about uh, 911 and did nothing to prevent this from occurring. And this is atrocious, it's unbelievable, have, having been a former FBI agent myself, and it's very obvious that this whole thing is being orchestrated by the powers that be at the highest level of our government, and I want the world to know about it. The minute I saw the planes fly in to the tower on television, live as a matter of fact, the question I had in my mind was, there is no way, absolutely no way, that somebody could skyjack four planes, 20 people skyjack four planes, in this case 19 individuals, and our government would not know about it in, in advance. We have, the U.S. government, the most advanced intelligence techniques of anybody in the world. And there, it, you'll never convince me we didn't have advanced knowledge about what was going on. We saw the airplanes go in, and uh, it's also a question about whether they're remotely controlled. I don't know about that. I hate to comment on something that I, where I have no documentation. Uh, but uh, there's much more to this story than has come out so far. Uh, you will never in a million years convince me that those, uh, those buildings, those towers, uh, collapsed because those planes hit them. I'm, I'm confident that they were imploded. As a matter of fact, the, uh, there were seismograph uh, readings uh, from the, they think from the base of two of them, about the time that the buildings uh, uh, collapsed. There were also molten steel that uh, was in the basement, uh, which is uh, a very high temperature uh, for uh, mel melting steel, and those planes hit above the 80th floor, so there's no way that that airplane fuel could have dropped down that low. Also, there were fires that burned in the basement for some 100 days afterwards. So there's some implication, there, there, there's some finagling, there's some maneuvering, uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, and there are many, many more people involved in this than these, these so-called skyjackers and terrorists. The uh, anti-terrorism legislation uh, was written back in the middle 1980s under the George Bush Senior Administration. A female Department of Justice um, attorney, who was one of the authors, made the statement publicly, before this passes Congress, people have to be killed. Now, if we fast forward to a World Trade Center car bombing in February 1993. At that time, the FBI had a 43-year-old former Egyptian army officer as an informant who was in with the terrorists. He was commissioned by the terrorists to put the bomb together. He went to his FBI superiors, we're going to use a dummy bomb, right? And they said, no, we're going to use a real bomb. So the FBI not only knew in advance that they were going to bomb the World Trade Center, they furnished the ingredients for the bomb, which is absolutely unbelievable that they get away with this. What's unbelievable about it is this was actually printed in the New York Times on October 28, 1993. But they got away with it. And if I was a congressman or senator, I would demand an investigation. Why would the FBI furnish the ingredients for the bomb that brought down or that, that had damaged the uh, World Trade Center in February 1993? We had six people killed there. We had uh, a thousand people injured. We had a total of six citizens um, who died in the February 1993 uh, World Trade Center car bombing. Uh, we had a thousand dollars worth of, uh, a thousand individuals were injured. We had uh, half a million dollars in damage. Uh, but there weren't enough people who died to pass the anti-terrorism legislation. So now we fast forward to uh, May the 19th, uh, April the 19th, 1995, World Trade, excuse me, uh, Oklahoma City bombing. We had 168, 169 people who died, probably 169 because there was one leg they never did identify. And uh, a year later, the anti-terrorism legislation passed. 
Now, it wasn't tough enough. I can't prove that there were explosives that were placed in the World Trade Center in the 911 uh, situation. However, I, from what I've seen, uh, a, a, an expert uh, on implosions from Albuquerque, New Mexico, who worked for the government uh, as under government contract, stated immediately afterwards that the buildings were imploded. And then he retracted his statement and said, well, maybe they were, maybe they weren't. But basically, now he's saying that they weren't imploded. Uh, but uh, other experts who have looked at the, at the pictures uh, say that the buildings were imploded. I think that uh, in order to implode those buildings, there had to be uh, implications, government implications or involvement uh, in placing these charges. I mean, that was a tremendous uh, project. Uh, I mean, I don't know how many people would be involved in it. Going back to Oklahoma City, an inside investigator told me there were at least 11 other people involved in the Oklahoma City bombing. Now, if you have 11 other people involved in Oklahoma City, you're going to have three or four times that involved in the World Trade Center uh, situation. Going back to Oklahoma City, uh, the government claimed uh, that there was a fertilizer, uh, ammonia nitrate fertilizer bomb in the truck. Initially, it came out, I think, with 1,500 pounds, and then it's 2,500 pounds. That, and that in the end, they said 4,800 pounds. Uh, a fertilizer bomb explodes in 360 degree, uh, but there's no question about it. The bomb that was in that truck was a directional bomb. Now, there was a bomb called Electrohydrodynamic Gaseous Fuel Device that was developed in the early 1980s, highly classified. It was developed by Hercules Manufacturing in uh, Silicon Valley, California. Uh, at the time of the first explosion in the experiment on, in Area 51, two technicians uh, died because they underestimated its, uh, the power uh, and, and the strength of this bomb. My informant, my main informant, Michael Reconosuto, whose firm, Hercules Manufacturing, actually developed this bomb. Michael was with the agency for years, as was his father, Marshall, told me that the bomb, in the, the truck bomb in Oklahoma City was this electrohydrodynamic gaseous fuel device. We call it a pineapple bomb because it's the size of a pineapple, but a very, very powerful. And then what I think happened in Oklahoma City is that we had the pineapple bomb go off and then nine seconds later, we had a conventional bomb go off on the inside. With regard to this proceeding, basically, there are four elements that I have to uh, uh, receive information regarding. Them. I have a newspaper article, actually a publication from the Fireman's uh, uh, Magazine, where the author, who is the ed editor of the magazine and obtained the information from the Oklahoma City Fire Department, states that four unexploded devices were brought out of Oklahoma City, the Murrah Building. That four unexploded devices were brought out of the Murrah Building. This is in this article, Fireman's Publication. I think it was September of, uh, of uh, 1995 when it was published. Now, if, uh, if that's the case, then you had five conventional bombs planted on the inside, and you had the barometric bomb or the pineapple bomb in the truck. And uh, now we have the news media. I have copies of the news media that were recorded that afternoon, uh, the afternoon of o Oklahoma City. And reporter after reporter after reporter has made the statement, oh, they recovered an un a bomb, a bomb that was unexploded. One of them is specifically said they recovered a bomb, and now we're going to know 
where the bombs came from because it has U.S. Army written on the side, stencil on the side. So we have, uh, and McVeigh, as far as McVeigh was concerned, I, I think McVeigh was a mind control victim. Um, he, they, the government said he's flunked out of special forces. I doubt that. I think he uh, was in special forces. He wrote a letter to his sister saying he'd been recruited by the CIA to be trained as a professional assassin and also to work on the CIA drug operation. And um, he was visited in Oklahoma City and in Colorado when he was in custody by Dr. Jolly West, DLA. Dr. West is the foremost expert on MKUltra. MKUltra is a government uh, CIA mind control program. I was not, I had absolutely no knowledge of the project MKUltra, the Monarch Project, during the period I was in the FBI. It was only after I got out of the FBI and I started doing my own research. And that came about because I was the investigator of the Jeffrey R. McDonald case. Uh, he's a former Green Beret doctor who was convicted of murdering his wife and two children in Fort Bragg, February 17, 1970. And he was tried and convicted, sentenced to three consecutive life sentences. I was called into the case after he'd been tried and convicted. His friend said he's innocent, and I began my investigation. And within 10 months, October 25, 1980, I obtained a signed confession from a girl, uh, Helena Stokely who said Dr. McDonald did not commit those crimes. They were committed by her satanic cult group. The satanic cult group was distributing drugs up and down the East Coast. They were being flown in plastic bags of the body cavities of the dead GIs coming out of Southeast Asia. And this is the late 60s, early 70s. This is all documented. Time Magazine, January 1, 1973. Dr. McDonald is absolutely innocent. And he's in jail today, 20-some years, in prison. Now, the reason I tell you about that case is because after I developed this information and went public with my confession from Helena, um, I uh, was on national TV, I was on radio talk shows, and people came from all parts of the United States and said, hey, I know all about that, satanic cults, uh, it's for real, I'm a, a victim, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that's how I became involved and embroiled uh, in these very controversial issues. And then I started doing my own research and one thing led to another. And then I investigated the international child kidnapping ring out of the, the Midwest, out of Nebraska. They were, they were flying children uh, out of uh, Sioux City, Iowa, to Washington, D.C. for sex orgies with congressmen and senators. Uh, and uh, just went on and on. Then I had uh, the McMartin case out of the Southern, Man, uh, Southern California. The children uh, were dropped off in the school in the morning by their parents. They picked them up late in the afternoon in the interim. Uh, they put the kids through tunnels and up into the trap door of the triplex next door, put them in automobiles and prostituted them. Two, three, four-year-old children. Unbelievable. And this is, this is how I became in, in, involved in all these issues. And I just kept going. As any good investigator would do, I just keep going. The, the international child kidnapping ring is not being exposed. I have personally given uh, my documentation to the FBI on at least six or eight occasions, and I have been ignored because it's a covert CIA child kidnapping operation that's been active since the early 1960s. What's happening here is these children are being flown, or were in the past in the 1980s, uh, out of Sioux City, Iowa, to uh, Washington, D.C. for these sex orgies for the purpose of uh, blackmailing the congressman of compromising them. And of course, hey, there's a bill that's going to be passed on Monday and that I can come around to you and say, Congressman, uh, you remember when you were with that little boy, that little girl last Friday? Okay, you better vote this way. This is, that's exactly what's happening. It's called blackmail. This is a CIA covert operation. It's called the Finders out of Washington, D.C. And they're involved in kidnapping and international trafficking of children around the world. And I had, in my day, in the 80s, I had one of the kids who was actually part of the kidnapping team. When he was 10, 11, 12 years old, they would put him out as a decoy in a park, sort of shopping malls and so forth, and uh, to attract the kids his age over near the car. And then the adults would grab the children and be off with them. One little kid was a 12-year-old newspaper boy named Johnny Gosh out of West Des Moines, Iowa. Uh, Johnny Gosh was kidnapped. And uh, back in 1982, 
Uh, he was taken in, used as a sex slave. Later, he and another kid uh, uh, escaped. They stole a car and escaped. And Johnny Gosh is in hiding right today, by the way. The children um, are used for body parts. They're used for uh, satanic ceremonies, human sacrifices. They're used as sex slaves. Uh, in 1997, I think it was, I was in Denver giving a lecture. I had a tip from an airline employee the 210 children uh, flew out of Denver to New York and then on to Paris, France. The airline employee uh, who saw this was refueling the plane, asked a female adult and two uh, male adults who were with the children, asked a female adult and two male adults who were with the children, who are these kids and they said the woman says child protective services mind your own business and uh, that man by the way has disappeared i also had a tip from an airline employee a, a flight attendant uh, out of los angeles that a plane load of kids children was flown to paris france paul benassi my informant inside the nebraska case who was part of the net the child network told me that he's at least some of these kids are auctioned off uh he's attended six such auctions as few as six and as many as 36 children were auctioned off at these uh, various uh, the, the, at these various auctions. The children sell for up to $50,000 each, sometimes more. Uh, the ages are 2 to 21. The kids stand on a stage in their underwear with a number across their, uh, with a string around their neck and a number on a cord, on, on a, a piece of cardboard, and the people in the audience bid on them, just like bidding on an automobile. This is going on right under our nose. I've given this to the FBI and demanded investigation. I gave the latest uh, complaint I filed is in writing uh, as of November of this last year. I just keep pumping it over to them, keep giving it to them. And I have a U.S. Customs report that documents this. I'm Ted L. Gunderson, a 27-year veteran of the FBI who retired uh, in March of 1979. At the time of my retirement, I was the senior special agent in charge of the FBI Los Angeles Division with more than 700 personnel under my command and a budget of 22.5 L. Gunderson, a 27-year veteran of the FBI who retired in March of 1979. At the time of my retirement, I was the senior special agent in charge of the FBI Los Angeles Division with more than 700 personnel under my command and a budget of $22.5 million. This is what I think has happened. We have a covert group within our intelligence community who operate covertly. And then we have another group who operate overtly. The ones who are operating overtly are the ones that come around in suits and ask you questions about a bank robbery or, a, or about, um, let's say, a stolen car, right? The ones who are operating covertly are the ones who are involved in surreptitious entries who are involved in kidnapping the children, who are involved in drugs, who are involved in cover-ups, uh, and who are involved in assassinations. I happen to know of a, a squad of five FBI agents. This was back in the 1980s. A man, an agent from each of five divisions, they'd be given a signal to meet, and they'd meet in a, at one particular location, departmentalized, of course, so that uh, they didn't have more than one from one division. And then they would go out and do their dirty work. Now, it's, it's well documented that CIA has assassination squads. So you have to understand there's covert and overt in the intelligence community. That's what I think is happening here. What, what process do they go through to reach the highest levels of the CIA and the FBI? You mean in, in covert operation? Well, I mean, how culpable, how guilty, how knowledgeable are these individuals who rise to the, to the heights of uh, the head of the FBI at today? In, in my day, and now you have to understand, I've been out of the FBI for 25 years, but in my day, the men who rose to the top of the FBI were comp very competent, very capable men, very honest, basically. Uh, after the 
the beginning of the deterioration of this great organization, uh, then I'm sure that people who do rise to the top are the ones who answer to the orders of the ones and the superiors above them who are in Washington, D.C. I, I, I don't think there's any question about the direction that they're told to take. Now, Colleen Rowley, Rowley out of uh, Minneapolis, she wouldn't answer to the to the the, uh, the people, her superiors in Washington, D.C. She told it like it is. I was very proud of her, by the way. Uh, but these men are these men are not dummies, but they have to comply with the wishes in their assignments and they have to do the illegal activity if they want to proceed and pay the rent and take care of their kids and family at home. What, what is what's the psychological toll on these people who know that what they're doing is not on the up and up and yet are not at one with the program? I don't think anybody in that position where they are in a forced to do an illegal act of some sort, say assassination or burglary or something. Uh, I think that in some instances they think they're doing it in the interest of national security. In other instances, uh, they're probably just evil by nature. And I don't think that there ha has any psychological effect on them probably at that time. The ones who may have a conscience, uh, it probably affects them later on in their life. I would say so. I don't know, you know. We, for example, there are uh, FBI agents who intimidate witnesses, for example, in, in uh, Florida, uh, told not to talk, don't talk to anybody. If we do, we'll make your life miserable. And then their lives become miserable when they do talk. What level of are the operatives or agents are they? Any uh, agent that intimidates somebody, it could be part of the covert operation or part of the overt operation. But regardless, I don't think it's the covert because those men involved in the covert activity do not identify themselves. Anybody who identifies himself uh, and comes out and says, you're talking, uh, we're going to make your life miserable, would be an uh, a overt operation, part of the overt operation. Now, we were told under no circumstances in my day do you intimidate anybody. Under no circumstances do you threaten anybody. Uh, but today it's changed. And uh, I was interviewed by the FBI and the postal inspectors here about three weeks ago for an hour and a half because I received a threatening letter, by the way, from New Hampshire as part of the whatever, the mix. It's, that goes with the territory, by the what way. Do you mean New Hampshire? Why is New Hampshire? Uh, I don't know. Yeah, Why? Like, huh? Casinos? Casinos there? No, no. It, it, was, uh, it was a threatening letter and, uh, about, uh, you know, your life's going to be short if you don't clean up your act and back off and that sort of thing. Uh, but I receive those all the time. But uh, there was powder in there. So I went to the post inspector with the with the letter and uh, and it was analyzed there was nothing there it wasn't anthrax or anything like that but uh, I mean they don't dare intim they don't dare threaten me because I will stand up nose to nose with these people now I may end up being arrested someday but there have been attempts to frame me in the past in the 1980s 82 83 they attempted to set me up on a drug case uh, they also attempted to um, set me up on a fraud case, so that didn't work, and then I had a couple of contracts issued on me in the 80s, and now the latest technique is um, the disinformation program. The FBI informant is a fellow named Stu Webb. As a matter of fact, I can prove he's uh, an informant because I have the documentation, so you don't have to worry about being sued. Uh, a fellow named Stu Webb is out there on the Internet saying that I'm, uh, I was kicked out of the FBI for practicing satanic ceremonies in the federal building, I uh, married a Satanist and had it annulled. I stole $150,000. Uh, I'm an informant for the FBI. I'm an informant for the CIA. These things are, these are outlandish lies. Uh, but that's the technique that they're using now to try. They couldn't kill me. They couldn't prosecute me. And I'm not underestimating that, that they might not do it in the future. But they failed in those areas. So now they're going to come after me with, the, with lies and deceit. And uh, that could be on the part of uh, probably the overt operations in the FBI. What, uh, when was the change? What change? When was the change that came about that changed the direction of the FBI? Well, I, I think it started changing after J. Edgar Hoover died. Uh, Clarence Kelly, it didn't change that much under Clarence Kelly. Uh, it started, uh, they changed their uh, qualifications for applicants. Uh, probably when Ju uh, uh, Judge uh, Webster was in, or maybe uh, when uh, Clarence Kelly was in. And then we had a series of directors uh, who were a catastrophe. Uh, one in particular, Louis Free. Uh, he was absolutely uh, the worst director that you could pick 
former judge and former FBI agent. Uh, and now, of course, Mr. Mueller, I don't know anything about him, but he has to be one of the cool boys uh, to go along uh, with uh, what's happening in Washington, D.C., and to allow uh, this to happen where, you know, we have skyjackings. Hey, four airplanes are skyjacking. We didn't know about it in advance. Come on, give me a break. Um, my understanding, largely from, uh, I think, Samson's book on the FBI, you're probably familiar with it. I think it's the Samson. In any case, uh, that Hoover, and I just want to clarify this for my own self, largely. Hoover, uh, as I understand it, went after uh, the communists and left, uh, largely dissuaded from going after uh, organized crime, largely because the organized crime, Lansky and others, had the goods on uh, Hoover. What do you think of that thesis? The, uh, let's go back to the, the secret files that Jed Hoover kept on congressman senators. Let me explain what happened there. I'm an FBI agent. I go out on a bank robbery, and I'll come back and answer the, that question again that you just posed to me. And while I'm on this bank robbery, I'm interviewing a witness. The witness is, oh, the bank robber is uh, 5'10", 175 pounds, white male, etc. Oh, by the way, Mr. Gunderson, let me mention that uh, I have knowledge about Congressman XYZ who visited a house of prostitution last week. And uh, this is where he went, and he paid for it with a personal check, by the way. And by the way, we had a case just like that. He was a congressman from Tennessee. And so what I do as an FBI agent, I write up my bank arm report, and then I would put that information in the old days, and I, don't, I think right now they're not doing anything with that type of information, in a memo and send it to Washington, D.C. It would go into Hoover's outer office and be kept there because this is a prominent individual. The way it was used from a practical standpoint was, say, Congressman XYZ, is being going to be considered for a judgeship or for an ambassador. We had to investigate those people. Then we would conduct an investigation. Otherwise, the information just lay dormant in Mr. Hoover's outer office. We couldn't get our hands on it. We had to go through Ms. Candy to get the information. So that's the, that's the, that's the practical side of those files. But I'd like to also mention that in the, in the old days under J. Edgar Hoover, when he had these, the quote, goods on congressmen and senators, we didn't have the corruption then that we do have today. COINTELPRO. Oh. COINTELPRO operated during Hoover's uh, uh, reign, and that was a political operation. Uh, Co COINTELPRO, uh, I'm telling you right now, I have to confess, I was actively involved in COINTELPRO against the Black Panthers in the 1960s in New Haven, Connecticut. Uh, it was a very effective program, but it was, it's basically the same thing that they're doing now, or they don't call it, they don't have a name for it now, where they put out disinformation. And I'm it's, it's, it's gone uh, all the way around the, the, the horn with me. I was one of the persons who was active in COINTELPRO in the 60s. Now I'm one of the individuals who is on the receiving end of COINTELPRO. So I kind of have to laugh, to laugh about that. Yes, COINTELPRO was, uh, uh, was an operation that was established by William C. Sullivan. I'd say he's probably the main person behind it. And it was a form of disinformation out uh, and, and corruption. Uh, I mean, uh, and disruption within... Uh, the organizations. For example, uh, an example would be uh, to write an anonymous letter to the head of the, say, the Black Panther Party in New Haven. And in that letter, we would say, uh, hey, uh, your secretary treasurer is, is uh, stealing from the, the funds. And then write an anonymous letter to the secretary treasurer, say, hey, the chairman of the Black Panther Party, of the party is having an affair with your wife. And uh, that would cause disruption within the ranks, yes. It was very effective. It was good. Uh, from the standpoint of, uh, of uh, neutralizing sources and causing problems from within. But it got much more serious in Chicago, for example, with Fred Hampton, didn't it? Well, Hampton was, um, was murdered, virtually murdered, by the Chicago Police Department. I've been told that FBI agents were there, but I, I was told, on the, on the contrary, there were no FBI agents present when Hampton was uh, shot. Uh, but uh, he was murdered by Chicago police. They just burst in the room, as, as I understand it, just blew him away. So that, That's, so that wouldn't be Cointel Pro. That would just be murder. The psychological state of an individual depends on that individual, whether he, he is able to cope with a situation that's dishonest under orders or whether he can't, can or can't. That's up to him. It's his decision to make. I think in some instances it has a, 
a psychological problem, creates a psychological problem within some individuals. Others who have no conscience, just like uh, the man walking down the street, it may not bother him at all. But Colleen Rowley in Minnesota, Minneapolis, Minnesota, who went, came forward on the search warrants on Missouri uh, and tried to get a search warrant on him and was uh, rebuffed. Uh, I mean, she has a conscience. She's a very uh, dedicated, honest person, obviously. Uh, and it bothered her that uh, she could not uh, follow up with the, what she felt was a very important and a very necessary step in the investigation of this case. It bothered her, so she went public with it, and she attacked the director with a letter to him. Uh, well, that's the way it should be. When I was a, when I was in a position of authority, and I had to promote a, somebody within the organization to be a supervisor, I would pick out not the guy that came in and was, uh, you know, lick, you know, kissing me all the time, so to speak. Uh, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But I would pick, I would pick out the one who wanted to argue with me. A guy who said, hey, here's the way I think, here's what I, uh, here's the way I feel, here's what I think we should do. Those are the guys I wanted under me because, I mean, w whether they're right or I'm right in a situation, at least I have the other side of the story. What would you say the general consensus of the FBI agents uh, is today about what actually happened on 9-11? I mean, because they certainly must be cognizant that the official story is false. And I would say that the general consensus of the FBI, again, it depends on the individual. Uh, it depends on whether he has a conscience. Uh, there's good and bad in the FBI. Uh, I think that probably what they're doing, if a certain FBI agent has a problem living with himself and living within the, 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 the terms of his assignments, say he's been told to go out and do something illegal and he has a problem with that, they probably would transfer him over to another squad. Uh, I know uh, I, I had a, a, a situation in Los Angeles where we had an incompetent agent, and he was working um, in a very sensitive position. Well, I took him out of there and put him uh, over on stolen car cases. Uh, if I have a man that's an excellent shot with a gun, and he's a lousy investigator, I put him on the firearms range instructing uh, on the firearms. That's the key to being successful at the top administrative level of any organization. So I think it depends on the individual. What, uh, what would you say the, uh, uh, the number of people who, I mean, we know Colleen Rowley's boss was promoted, uh, and, but what number of people were flushed out or left the FBI after? Do you, have you been attending to that after 9-11? I understand that uh, after 9-11, there are a number of FBI agents in the ranks who are very displeased with what's happening in our country today, who are aware of the maneuvering and the manipulation of the FBI in Oklahoma City. Uh, this deplorable situation in Waco, uh, Ruby Ridge, men with a conscience, and now we have 911. Uh, I understand that a lot of, quite a few fellows, have, uh, men and women, have uh, resigned. They can't handle it. And that's too bad because we need those people to stay in the ranks and come forth and try to make a change. But what happens then is it can affect, they can be transferred, it can affect their wife and their kids and their future as far as the retirement check is concerned. So, in effect, the FBI just gets, gets worse and worse as the better people are flushed out or leave. In, in effect, what happens is that the good guys, end of quote, uh, leave the organization and the more people uh, of less ability, maybe evil, psychologically uh, uh, defunct individuals, will come in. And so then we have the organization further deteriorates, deteriorates, deteriorates. Well, if you, if you work for the government as an operative or an informant, uh, CIA, FBI, and uh, you cross them afterwards or during the interim, uh, you usually end up one of two ways. Uh, you either end up uh, dead or you end up uh, being prosecuted. And they've attempted to prosecute me in the past. It hadn't worked. 
in my case i'm very fortunate because i have no first hand knowledge so everything i do as a researcher as a as an investigator is hearsay information so that's probably one of the reasons i have a an average insurance policy so to speak i'm ted l gunderson a 27 year veteran of the fbi who retired in march of 1979